This week on Arizona Illustrated, a special presentation, Arizona Public Media at the Emmys. The Arizonans, Morris Udall. He inspired people to be better, to be greater, to be more focused. Uh, he did it in the speeches, he did it in the committee, he did it the staff, and he just did it in how he led, led his life. On the border with Arizona 360, our role is to do the apprehension and get them into the care and custody of either ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or if they're unaccompanied children, into HHS. Working to identify migrants who perished in the desert. Right now, we don't know who he is. We have no leads to his identity. And monsoon chocolate. Whoa, wait a second. Chocolate is so much more complex than I ever thought it was. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Each year, regional chapters of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences recognize and reward excellence in their broadcasting communities with Emmy Awards. Last fall, Arizona Public Media received 12 individual Emmys and was nominated for the prestigious 2020 Overall Excellence Award for the fifth time in the last six years. On this episode of Arizona Illustrated, we present a collection of award-winning stories. First up, last year, AZPM created a pilot episode of a series of half-hour documentaries revealing the behind-the-headlines personal side of people who helped to forge Arizona into the remarkable state that it has become. Here is an excerpt from The Arizonans, Morris Udall. Oh, I'm not arrogant enough to think that uh, giving, giving me power or anyone else around here would uh, win the Cold War, uh, stop air and water pollution, eliminate poverty, uh, make our cities livable all next week. But I think you have to try. One of his courageous acts was to take on the uh, president of his own party and break with him on the war in Vietnam, particularly since his brother Stuart was a member of Johnson's cabinet at the time. I think his decision to no longer support the Vietnam War, that was a moral decision on his part. And he was willing to do it even at risk to his own political future. His fierceness was, though, when he embraced an issue, he put his whole self into it, and he was bound and determined to make it happen. The last time I caught you on the subject, you were wanting to uh, provide for universal registration so that you know, everybody could vote just by sort of sending it up. Postgarden. That's simply That's crucial. Good. That's simply crucial. Why is it crucial? In, in the <laughs> other democracies, they get 80 and 90 percent turnout. This so, last yeah. election, yeah. just let me make a point. This last election, and in 72, that Nixon mandate was given by less than half the voters in America. These are people who pay taxes, whose sons get drafted to go to Vietnam, and our society says we don't care whether you vote or not. As a matter of fact, a lot of Republicans and conservatives say we're better off if you don't vote. We're better off if a country has a system in which only the elite, the better educated, the more passionately involved in politics vote. I think that's wrong, and I think you destroy something very vital in democracy when you adopt that philosophy. We ought to have this postcard registration bill. We need it badly. He believed very deeply about civil liberties and social justice and the environment and some of those things. And he wanted to bring that voice to the national debate. He loved politics. And I mean, the high, as he would say, if you're gonna be in politics, aspire to be at the highest level and the highest level in the United States is president. So he said, I'm gonna run for president. I said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but you know, he had big ambition and he gave it a hell of a run. Udall entered the race for president in 1976 and finished second in an unprecedented number of individual state primary elections. At the end of the nominating process, he was runner-up to Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter in the Democratic presidential primary. Carter would go on to become the president. I worked for him for eight months on the trail and it was quite a seminal period of time for me. I think he really believed he could be a great president. And I think it played to everything. I mean, he was at the right age. He had a lot of energy. I think he um, 
I think he really enjoyed going around the country and talking to people. He actually would have been a really, really good president. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. We did our best. And we hit hard, but we hit fair. We had a big field. And we had a lot of tough fights. And I guess sometimes the words got a little loud and a little harsh. But I remembered an old prayer that was written for Democratic primaries. And it said, oh, Lord, help me to utter words which are gentle and tender because tomorrow we may have to eat them. To view the Arizonans, Morris Udall, visit azpm.org slash Arizonans. In late 2019, AZPM's public affairs program, Arizona 360, decided to take a closer look at new construction of border fencing in Cochise County, as well as some of the Trump administration's other approaches to curbing immigration at the southern border at the time. And the resulting program won an Emmy. Here is an excerpt. In Cochise County, the agency's future involves replacing some Normandy-style fencing with 18 to 30-foot-tall bollard fencing along mountainous terrain. According to documents from CBP, the project begins several miles east of Douglas and continues for 19 miles, crossing the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. The Army Corps of Engineers contracted with Southwest Valley constructors to build the wall. Our crew saw early work underway at a remote site leased from a rancher who told me crews are drawing groundwater from the property for a cement batch plant. The city of Douglas also signed an 18-month agreement to provide water services and lease land near the Douglas Municipal Airport. Douglas's finance director estimates the contractor will use between 200,000 and 500,000 gallons a month. He added that the city's daily water production averages about 5 million gallons a day. City officials anticipate an economic boost from the project as the influx of construction workers seek lodging and spend locally. Since the 90s, infrastructure along the border in and around Douglas has changed drastically. Police Chief Craig Fullen is a lifelong resident who joined the force 22 years ago. We discussed how built-up barriers have impacted public safety. Growing up here, uh, my recollection of the border barrier was a dilapidated uh, barbed wire fence and an unimproved ditch. Um, with the infrastructure that's been put in, Prior to that, the trend was for people to come across fairly freely um, and for that movement to be both north and south. With the influx that we had at that time, and this is like the late 90s into the early 2000s, it was very problematic because we had um, those people running into our neighborhoods, hiding in yards, um, trying to evade law enforcement. I think people who don't live in Douglas or aren't from here think of the border as a dangerous place. I mean, you're the top cop in this community. Would you say that's true? Uh, I think the perception is there, um, definitely. We do get inquiries from time to time, um, Little League teams that are coming from either out of town or out of state, wanting to know if it's safe for their child to come down and participate in a tournament. Um, that's kind of the challenge that we have as well, is trying to overcome that stigma of being an unsafe community because of our location here on the border, um, when in fact our experience is uh, to the contrary. Uh, I consider our community very safe. To view the full award-winning program, visit azpm.org border360. In the midst of the national conversation on immigration, often what gets lost are the stories of people making the dangerous journey, which in many cases leads to their death. Arizona Illustrated producer Vanessa Barchfield brought us a story about Tucsonans who are working to find and identify those who didn't survive. Here is an excerpt from What Remains. We are at milepost seven on South Mission Road. Not far from Mission San Javier, not far from Tucson, we're not far from Saurita. And 
a human being disappeared here in the spot where we're standing. This is an individual who was found with no other personal effects, no clothing, no backpack, nothing. Found on the Tohoto Odom Nation in August uh, of last year, 2018. The condition of his remains suggests to us that he probably lay out there for one to three months. Nancy was from Lima, Peru. She had two daughters who lived in New York. She hadn't seen them in years. She was getting extremely depressed. And when she lost her job in 2009, that was the last straw and she took off north. Nancy had dyed her hair white to look older so that she wouldn't be abused or raped during her journey. This is the humerus, the upper arm bone, and we can see on him, and one of the reasons we know he's a teenager, is that that bone hadn't, hadn't fully fused. So there was cartilage between this part of the bone and the main part of the bone, so he could have gotten taller. She took buses all the way through Central America and Mexico, and then she joined up with a coyote, with a guide, and another group of other migrants. They crossed the international boundary pretty quickly on, on foot, and then they were met by a vehicle that drove them north. Border Patrol pulled up behind them. Everyone who could escape the van ran out into the desert, um, including Nancy. From there, she was just missing, and the family began what would be a years-long process of trying to find out what happened. Right now, we don't know who he is. We have no leads to his identity. As soon as Nancy disappeared, the family actually flew out to this area and searched the desert themselves, interviewed witnesses. I met with them in a hotel off the side of I-10 and took a missing persons report, tried to go to report at police where they were turned away. They went to Border Patrol themselves. They visited consulates. We're hoping that his mother or his father or another family member eventually reaches out and tells us that he went missing. Not only is loss, uh, personal loss, a tragedy, this limbo, this not knowing if they're alive or dead, and if they are dead, has, has the body been found but nobody has put two and two together, or are they still laying out there? Part of what we do here is to determine how somebody died, the manner of death, the cause of death, and then help law enforcement with identification. We now know that actually her remains were found in 2011, about three and a half miles north of here. It took, however, until 2017 for that cranium that was found to be identified as Nancy's. We've had a slow motion mass disaster played out over the last 19, 20 years. 3,000 people have come into this office for a post-mortem examination. Some were bodies of people who died that day or the day before. Other people were just represented by a single sun-bleached bone. Of those 3,000, 2,000 have been identified as a specific individual, all from south of the U.S.-Mexico border. We're on the Tohoto Odom Nation, the San Javier District, and uh, we're working with Tohoto Odom Police Department on these two mock death scenes, if you will. That's at 6 4. One is a typical scatter of remains by animals of somebody who dies on the desert floor, and the other one's somebody who dies in a dry wash, and then their body decomposes, it skeletonizes, and then when the waters come, as we know they always will, some of the bones get washed downstream. This 
is kind of exposed, ready to be photographed, and then removed. We always like to talk to the law enforcement officers who are responsible for recovering these remains because we do very few recoveries. The Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner, very rarely do we send an anthropologist or a pathologist or an investigator out to a scene. So we're almost totally reliant on the skills of law enforcement officers. That's gonna indicate I've got two individuals. Am I gonna be able to see, you know, oh, well that other left tibia was found 100 yards from here. These folks uh, lived a hard life and their, their skin and their teeth and their bones reflect these stressors that have accumulated. In this young man's case, he didn't live too long, but he still has some of these childhood stress marks written on his bones. Something that I observed about Bruce Anderson in the early 2000s, he wrote by hand hundreds of missing persons reports. Families were calling him and he didn't turn them away. It wasn't the right place. You know, a forensic anthropologist usually isn't taking missing persons reports. Usually you refer that to police. Bruce knew that they couldn't go to police. I started typing all of his handwritten missing persons reports into a database. One of them was for a Guatemalan woman. He had stapled a beautiful picture of her wearing traditional Guatemalan traje to his handwritten report. And in addition to her name and the date of disappearance and her age, he'd written on the margin a note that said, she was a nice person. And that stood out to me. It was the representation of someone who was not only collecting data as a scientist, but also listening to a family and being there with them in that moment of crisis. I know that my best day as a forensic anthropologist, gleaning some really important information, that can lead to an identification, that then becomes the worst day a mother or a wife could ever have because now we know this John Doe has been identified as, as their son or their husband. So I have to temper, I think most of us do, temper our satisfaction with ourselves of doing a good job by knowing that that's the outcome. Forensic anthropology can not only identify one individual person, but it can also show patterns across many cases. The genetic estimate of all living humans is that we're 99.9% .9 alike. In my job, I can do a better service if I can find some of those differences. There's a quote from Ruth Benedict that the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human difference. It's a very precise science that can come to interact with very deep human need for answers, for truth, and for justice. Most of the photos you saw in that story are of objects, including shoes, ID cards, and jewelry, found alongside human remains in Arizona's border region. The photos are from a national database of missing and unidentified people, and you can search the database online at nameus.gov. Chocolate is one of the most loved, celebrated, and consumed confections in the country. One local Tucson entrepreneur is taking it to a whole new level of taste complexity and sophistication with an eye on ethical practices and sustainability. This is Monsoon Chocolate. One of the things that has drawn me to chocolate is the fact that it is just so complex. It's really one of the most complex flavor substances known to man. It's got between 600 and 800 volatile compounds. That puts it off the chart. That's like higher than wine, cheese, beer, coffee. And those are all things that are very complex. Once we receive cocoa beans, the first step is to sort them. We're looking for properly fermented beans that have not germinated. We work with cocoa producers in Ecuador, Peru, Madagascar, Tanzania, 
Uganda, Mexico, Vietnam, India. This is the, the cornerstone to everything that we do. So we're grinding up the, the cocoa nibs, so which is getting the nibs that have all already been roasted and winnowed and putting them in this molino, which was used to grind corn. The two stones pretty much just get caught in through here, grind them down, and then they get spat out over here and turned into cocoa liquor. The content of cocoa butter is all different in the beans, so this one is flowing pretty freely. This is from Tanzania, but other origins don't have as much cocoa butter in the bean, and they'll come out very sludgy. I just like to <laughs> reflect on that. and like, I think it's just so complex and crazy. I had like a basic general idea of chocolate and how it, the general like, oh, it's from a bean and then it gets turned into a bar, but I had no idea all of the other processes involved. This machine is, is called a melanger. It's basically a stone grinder. Just making sure that the texture is smooth, that it's not gritty, because that will eventually translate to the actual bar. You want to make sure that it melts nicely on your tongue and that it has a good mouthfeel. It's also aerating and agitating the chocolate as it moves, which is helping to volatilize some of the organic compounds inside of it. It really just comes down to the bean and the formulation, but usually three to four days. Just this? Just this, yep, with little bits of maintenance from us. My interest in chocolate really just came out of my interest in food. I, I worked in restaurants for years and years, and then I moved from the restaurant industry into specialty grocery. So I was the grocery manager at Time Market, and when I started there, they had chocolate bars from Dandelion Chocolate. This was back in 2013. That was the first single origin bean to bar chocolate I ever tried. And it was revelatory. And when I tasted it, I just, you know, it's like, whoa, wait a second. Chocolate is so much more complex than I ever thought it was. All chocolate is made from cocoa beans. So all chocolate is bean to bar chocolate. But really, that, that phrase is being used to describe this movement of mostly small batch makers that have some sort of direct connection to the source of the cocoa. It's the phrase that our industry uses for this renaissance of, of new chocolate making. I really just wanted to understand the process more. I, I didn't intend on starting a company, but I just fell in love with the process. One of my favorite bonbon flavors is the black pepper caramel with white chocolate rose petal ganache. I make just a traditional caramel, but then I add black pepper extract and then I also add a little bit of finely ground black pepper so that it's like caramelly, but like a little bit spicy, but it's like still balanced. I think I like draw inspiration from my ethnic background too because I'm half Korean and half German, which is kind of a weird combination. Before I worked here, I basically knew nothing about chocolate. <laughs> I grew up in Germany. Pastry and baking there is just really traditional. So when I moved to the States, I like wanted to learn how to make pastry myself. I started at the B-Line under Terry LaChance, and she like taught me a lot. And then I was the head baker at Five Points, and then here. Instead of like building, you know, a multi-layered cake, you're kind of doing that all in one bite. Sometimes they'll like all come out at the same time. It's very rare, and it's really exciting. <laughs> ah, okay. oh, perfect crack out. <laughs> Visual is always the first thing that attracts someone or, or like intrigues them at least. So this is our prickly pear caramel bonbon. There are three different colored cocoa butter colors. So there's the white splatter, which 
it's just Jackson Pollock, you know? You just stand there and you just kind of fling the cocoa butter on the mold and it does its own thing. After that, there is this like light shimmery purple that we just use our, our finger and we just swipe in the mold. So it gives it a little bit of depth and texture. And then behind that is the dark purple, which just then really helps the rest of it pop. These are some of the variety of bonbons that we have to offer. Typically it starts with a flavor. Adam and Athena think of like a fun flavor to do. And from there we, we just kind of think, well, what, what kind of colors, what kind of decor would make sense for that flavor? It took me a good amount of time to be able to get this kind of motion to work for me. I was really clumsy at first. <laughs> I've been an artist most of my life. I went from painting and drawing into ceramics and just kind of stumbled into this. Using colored cocoa butter as a medium wasn't anything I had thought of, but once I started doing it, it was fun. Okay. So the chili mango is also three different colors, but this technique is all spraying. Originally we had like a green that just didn't quite seem like the right mango green, you know? And so we ordered a different one and then it just all came together. We really love how it turned out. And it's a delightful taste as well. <laughs> you know, mango with like a hint of spice. I really love when art can become intimate with someone. So in my ceramics, like I love making mugs. They are very intimate objects. So it's not that far to go to the bonbons. Most people often are like, they're too pretty to eat. But then I'm like, but then you eat them and you realize they're just as tasty, so you do eat them. <laughs>